God is the God of fresh starts, new beginnings, and second chances. Could you use some? <laughs> if so, welcome to Glory Days. A series of messages on the life and the book of Joshua. God gave him and the Hebrews a promised land life. He offers you the same. Let's make our Glory Days declaration, shall we? Fill your lungs with air and your hearts with hope. Now, I don't want you to say this unless you mean it. I've got a sincerity meter floating out there. Let's say it together. These days are glory days. My past is past. My future is bright. God's promises are true. His word is sure. With God as my helper. Though sometimes they don't feel like it, Father, what with the enemy and his attacks, sorrows, sadness, challenges, stress, we feel besieged on every side. Today, dear Father, your people, we, your people, come to you asking for nothing short of a supernatural breakthrough. Would you, Father, lift the weariness Strengthen the faint-hearted. Embolden the coward. Forgive the sinner. Have mercy upon the one who speaks. His sins are many. Help us to see Jesus. Through Christ we pray. And all the church said, for a book of conquests, the story of Joshua is sure skimpy on military details. How many generals did he have? How did he organize his troops? What weapons did he use? Did he have an elite force? If so, what kind of training did, they, did he require? The answer to all of these questions and others, we don't know. We don't know because the emphasis is not on a physical war but on a spiritual battle. The real conflict wasn't with the Canaanites or the Amorites or the Hittites. The real conflict was with Satan and his demons. Here's why. Canaan was the choicest real estate on earth. It connected Africa with Europe. It accessed the Mediterranean Sea. It was marked by fertile fields and valleys. But most important, this land was a gift of God to Israel. Four centuries earlier, God told Abraham, to your descendants I will give this land. So God set this property apart as a special place, and he set his people apart to be a special blessing for the entire world. God told Abraham, I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great and you shall be a blessing. So God would bless the people so they then could be a blessing. So this land was to be a place for God to stage or demonstrate His blessings. And the Hebrew people would be a blessing to others. They would be the couriers of God's covenant to a galaxy worth of people. This land played an important role in God's plan it was the parchment on which God's redemption story would be written. These names that we've come to treasure, the town of Bethlehem, the city of Jerusalem, the sacrifices at the temple, the arid area of, De of Nazareth, the Sea of Galilee, all were a part of this drama, all were a part of this land. But most importantly, the Redeemer would be born on this land. He would walk on this soil. He would live his life here. He would soak this dirt with his blood. He would shake this ground with his resurrection. So the book of Joshua isn't really about reclaiming real estate for a dislocated nation. It's more about preserving the stage, God's intended stage for his redemptive story. Satan's counter strategy then was to contaminate this promised land, contaminate it with evil, contaminate it with sin, contaminate the promised land, and by doing so preempt 
the promised child. If he could destroy God's people or keep God's people out of this place, then hopefully he would destroy God's work. So the battle in Joshua is really less about physical armies and more about a spiritual battle. Our battle, too, is a spiritual battle. Our fight is not against people on earth but against the rulers and authorities and the powers of this world's darkness, against the spiritual powers of evil in the heavenly world. That is why you need to put on God's full armor. Then on the day of evil, you will be able to stand strong. And when you have finished the whole fight, you will still be standing. So stand strong with the belt of truth tied around your waist and the protection of right living on your chest. On your feet, wear the good news of peace to help you stand strong. And also use the shield of faith with which you can stop all the burning arrows of the evil one. This idea of the evil one strikes many people as old and outdated. The popular trend of our day is to blame all of our problems on genetics or the government or on environment. The Bible, however, presents a real and present danger, a foe to our faith. His name is Satan. Other scriptures call him Beelzebul, Belial, the obstructor, the tempter, the evil one, the accuser, the prince of demons, the ruler of this world, or the prince of the power of the air. Whatever name you choose, the enemy is real, and so is the danger. Satan is not the cute and harmless character of the cartoons. He is not the imaginary counterpart to the Easter bunny. He is the invisible yet forceful fallen angel known as Lucifer who vied for the throne and crown of God. And when he could not have it, he was cast out. And he rebelled against God and he has sought to take every possible being down with him. The devil, your enemy, goes around like a roaring lion looking for someone to eat. Maybe you heard his roars even this week. You want to read his rap sheet? Satan incited David. He sought to sift Simon as wheat. He persuaded Judas Iscariot to turn against Jesus. He kept a disabled woman bound for 18 long years. He has blinded the minds of those who don't believe. As a result, they don't see the light of the good news. He is now at work in those who are disobedient. Satan incites, he sifts, he persuades, he binds, he rules, and he blinds. He has one objective, and that is to steal and to kill and destroy. And you you need to know that he is really ticked off at you. All this talk about promised land living, this talk about glory days, about putting your past in the past about receiving all God wants you to give and being all God wants you to be, about leaning into grace and not guilt, about walking in faith and not fear, this really bothers him. As long as he had you in the wilderness, walking in circles of doubt and discouragement, then you were of no concern, no threat to him. But now that you're pressing into God's promises... You've really put him in a foul mood. You have entered into enemy territory. Joshua did. For the first time in four centuries, the Hebrew people were camping in Canaan. They'd been talking about this ever since the days of Abraham when the promise was made. How many times had Hebrews gazed out from the wilderness across the Jordan at the promised land? Some of them had been waiting Joshua and Caleb had for 40 years. And when God opened the waters of the Jordan River, they didn't have to be asked twice. All told, about 40,000 armed soldiers crossed over before God to the plains of Jericho. They were ready for battle. I can just hear them running across with a hoop and a holler over that dried riverbed. 
Had God not stopped them, they would have gone straight to Jericho. But God did stop them. They were not ready. They probably thought they were ready. We probably would have thought they were ready. But God knew they weren't quite ready for the spiritual battle. So he stopped the invasion. He put everything on hold. And he gave the people <clears throat> two reminders. It's kind of like a mom when her son is about to go off to the school for the very first time, just as he's walking out the door, she gets eye level with him and says, now you remember, <laughs> you remember. That's what God did to the Hebrew people. He stopped everything and he said, you remember. And if you like to fill in the blanks, here's what he told them to remember. <clears throat> remember what God did. He wanted the people to remember what God did. And it came to pass when all the people had completely crossed over the Jordan that the Lord spoke to Joshua saying, Take for yourselves twelve men from the people, one man from every tribe, and command them saying, Take for yourselves twelve stones from here, out of the midst of the Jordan, from the place where the priest's feet stood firm. You shall carry them over with you <clears throat> and leave them in the lodging where you lodge here tonight, where you lodge tonight. Joshua did this. He commanded 12 men, <clears throat> one man from each tribe, to return to the riverbed. And from the very spot where the priests had stood holding the Ark of the Covenant, as the water was held at bay, they dislodged 12 stones. And they took those stones to Joshua. And Joshua stacked those stones in a monument or a memorial. When the twelfth stone was securely placed on the top, he turned to his people and he said this, When your children ask their fathers in time to come, saying, What are these stones? Then you shall let your children know. Israel crossed over this Jordan on dry land. For the Lord your God dried up the waters of the Jordan before you until you had crossed over. The first step of the saints in enemy territory is to pause to remember. The secret of survival in enemy territory, remember what God has done. Record His accomplishments in your biography. Stack some stones. Keep a list of the miracles that have happened in your life. Don't march into Jericho without looking back at the Jordan. Some years ago, my daughter reminded me of this. My middle daughter, Andrea, was in middle school at the time, and I was driving her to school. She noticed that I was a bit quiet that morning and something was bothering me. She said, Dad, why are you so quiet? I told her I had a book deadline and I was worried about meeting it. Now, kids are not always clued in on their parents' profession, and Andrea was just beginning to understand what her dad did for a living. So she said, haven't you written some other books? I said, I have. She said, how many? At that time, the answer was 15. So I told her, and she got real quiet, and she looked across the seat at me as I was driving, and she said, well, Dad, have, have you ever missed a deadline before? I said, no. She said, so God has already helped you 15 different times? <laughs> I said, yes. He's helped you each time? I really winced. She sure can sound like her mother sometimes. <laughs> if he has helped you 15 different times, don't you think he will help you this time? Stack some stones, Dad. Satan has no recourse to your testimony. Satan has no recourse to your testimony. He wants you to forget what God has done because he knows when you forget, fear comes in. For that reason, the psalmist says, don't forget a single blessing. 
He forgives your sins, everyone. He heals your diseases, everyone. He redeems you from hell, saves your life. He crowns you with love and mercy, a paradise crown. He wraps you in goodness, beauty eternal. He renews your youth. You're always young in His presence. God makes everything turn out right. He puts victims back on their feet. <laughs> Don't forget a single blessing. If you want to press into Jericho, take a moment and look back at the Jordan and be reminded what God has done. Maybe a good assignment would be for you to create a trophy room in your heart so that every so often you can just step in and say, look at all the paychecks God has provided. Look at all the opportunities God has provided. Look at all the prayers that God has answered. Again, Satan does not want you to remember this, but God does. Young David, I think, is our hero. Before David went in to fight Goliath, David thought backwards. He said, well, I've already killed a lion and a bear as a young shepherd. I think I can take on this Philistine. Because he remembered the lion and the bear, he could take on the giant. Don't forget the victories of your past. Because that's where you find strength for your future. Okay, okay, I'm imagining some soldier thinking, we've stacked these stones. Can we go into Jericho now? Not yet, not yet. First, we remember what God did, but then secondly, remember whose you are. At that time, the Lord said to Joshua, Make flint knives for yourselves and circumcise the sons of Israel again the second time. You just read the most unusual military tactic in the history of invasions. 600 years earlier, God had inaugurated the practice of male circumcision. Circumcision, he told Abraham, shall be a sign of the covenant between me and you. So within eight days of birth, every male child was to be symbolically set apart. His organ of male identity altered. He was to be set apart, not like the pagans who knew no God or who knew many gods. He was a child of the covenant. His identity was changed. Now, during the 40 years of the wilderness wanderings, the Hebrews let this practice lapse. We can only imagine why. Their hearts were hard. The people ignored the instructions. And they would have been tempted to ignore them again. It made sense. I mean, this act would leave the men in convalescence for weeks. The wives and the children would be unprotected by the seven enemy nations. They were watching every move. Shouldn't the men remain at maximum strength so they could fight? Yet the military strength of the soldiers really did not mean much to God. He didn't need their agility. He wasn't counting on their numbers or their muscles. He just wanted them to remember whose they were. They were his people. And specifically, the Scripture says he wanted to roll away the reproach of Egypt. That is to say, he was ready for the people to put those terrible days of Egyptian slavery behind them. Roll it away, the reproach, the embarrassment, the shame. They had become the laughing stock of all the nations, these Hebrew people who had been taken into captivity turned into slaves by the Egyptians. God wanted to put that permanently in the past. He wanted a clean break. You might say he wanted to cut off that part of their history. Circumcision, then, was a symbolic separation with the past. The act declared a new day, a new identity. You're no longer who you were, God was saying. You now are mine. You're no longer slaves. You're free. You're no longer in bondage. You're liberated. So God's message to the Hebrews was, remember whose you are. 
God's message to you and me. Remember whose you are. In a sense, all believers have been circumcised. This may be news to you, but the Apostle Paul wrote, when you came to Christ, He set you free from your evil desires, not by a bodily operation of circumcision, but by a spiritual operation, the baptism of your souls. Christ cut away your old life, the old life with its longings, with its lusts, with its guilt. He cut it away. He separated you away from that old life. When you gave your heart to Christ, He detached you from the power of your former life. Your identity has been forever altered. All that is of death and of the devil, He has cut away. It no longer has influence over you. You're no longer held under the act of condemnation, the guilt of it, and you're no longer held under the control of it. The other night I attended a banquet in benefit of the Grace House. The Grace House is a transition home for women who are coming out of a difficult chapter of life. Women who have spent time in prison. A dozen or so women at a time live in this house under the same roof. They sit at the same table. They learn a trade. But most of all, they learn their new identity in Christ. One of the ladies uh, told her story. She gave her testimony. She described a former life of prostitution and drugs and alcohol, a time in which she lost her marriage, she lost her children, ultimately she lost her freedom. But then Christ found her. What struck me in her story was the rhythm of her message. She kept saying, I was, but now. I was, but now. I was on the streets, but now I'm on my feet. I was on drugs, but now I'm clean. I was all alone, but now I have friends. I was, but now. I was, but now. This is the chorus of grace. And this is the work of God. And you can say this as well. I was, but now. I was lost, but now I am found. God has forever altered your identity. Do not underestimate what happened the moment you gave your heart to Christ. It could very well be that the undiscovered secret of the Christian life is the supernatural miracle that happens in what appears to be a simple act of confession and conversion. We need to understand that at that moment, something supernatural and miraculous happens. And that is the old life, with all of its temptation, with all of its longings, with all of its lustings, is disempowered. It is cut away. It cannot be stated too often or pondered too much. When Christ died, you died. When Christ was buried, your old self was buried. When Christ rose from the dead, a new you rose from the dead. And when you connected yourself, when you identified yourself with the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, you were buried, you were, you were killed, you were buried, and you rose from the dead. And a new you stands. You are not who you used to be. And just because you used to be doesn't mean you will be. And just because your parents were, that doesn't mean you will be. And just because everybody else was, that doesn't mean you will be. You have been severed. You have been separated from all of the power of the past. Your dad was a drunk. You don't have to be one. Everybody else was poor. You don't have to be poor. Everybody else was cranky or a bigot or prejudiced. doesn't mean you have to be. You are not held to be anything anyone else was. 
Why? Because Christ himself has deposited himself within you. And his plan is that in time, as you grow from glory into glory into glory, more and more Christ will come out and less and less of you will appear. I think this was the Apostle Paul's favorite theme. Maybe summarized in this admonition. He said, consider yourselves to be dead to the power of sin and alive to God. In other words, when the power of sin comes, when temptation comes, when pornography comes, when alcohol comes, when greed comes, then you just take a stand against it for crying out loud. I am dead to you. What are you doing showing up? You don't live here any longer. I'm dead to you. How dare you? How dare you dare to tempt me again? Don't you know you were buried when I was buried? Don't you know you're six feet under? Don't you know? I am no longer who I used to be. I was, but now. Well, who are you now? I'm so glad you asked. (laughs) You are God's child, Christ's friend, a member of Christ's body, a saint, redeemed and forgiven of all your sins, complete in Christ, lacking in nothing, free from condemnation, God's co-worker, seated with Christ in the heavenly realm, God's workmanship, a citizen of heaven, adopted into God's family, born of God, and the evil one cannot touch you. You, Amen. You, You don't need to try to be somebody else. You just need to be who you already are. Just lean into these promises. Walk in the Spirit. In time, in time, God will change you from one degree of glory to the next. And that list will increase of I was but nows. Every day a new victory. Every day a new change. Every day a new development. You will not be who you are. You are not who you were. Now, Satan does not want you to know this. This is why your first step into the promised land is to reaffirm your identity. He either doesn't want you to know this, or if you know it, he wants you to forget it. So the next time he comes at you, you remind him who you are. You say, no, I've been bought with a price. I belong to God. I have not been given a spirit of fear, but of power and love and a sound mind. I cannot be separated from the love of God. I can find grace and mercy at the time of need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. This is called putting on the belt of truth, responding to lies with truth. It is a battle, and the battle is fought right up here in your thoughts. And you have to stand, just because you have a thought, you don't have to think it. Right? Just because you have a thought... You don't have to think it. You can take every thought captive and you stand it down with the weapon, with, 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 the, with the shield of faith. You, you, you stand against those fiery darts, these lies of the devil, and you stand them down and you say, no, I am a new person. Promised land people do this. Promised land people don't think like other people think. Promised land people have a reverent swagger to their walk. They say, you know, I've got a new dad. I've got a new identity. I've got a new name on my birth certificate. I've got a destiny that's out of this world. I've been spiritually circumcised. I know that's a terribly awkward term and very indelicate, but it is a biblical concept. So just let the symbolism instruct you that God has removed all that is of death and is lifeless. You're a new creation. God's Spirit who is in you is greater than the devil who is in the world. So how do you survive in enemy territory? You're constantly remembering what God has done. You're constantly remembering whose child you are. Well, the Hebrews did this. They stacked the stones. They reinaugurated the rite of circumcision. I can't help but think that some of the soldiers were thinking, isn't this a waste of time? Isn't this a waste of time? I mean, we've got these enemy nations coming at us. 
And now we're all in convalescence and recovery. We're vulnerable. We could be attacked any day. What a waste of time. Shouldn't we be going to fight? <laughs> Not if you want God to fight for you. I don't know if you noticed this verse in chapter 5, verses 1 and 2. And so it was when all the kings of the Amorites who were on the west side of the Jordan and all the kings who were by the sea heard that the Lord had dried up the waters of the Jordan, their heart melted, and there was no spirit in them any longer because of the children of Israel. Look, their hearts melted, and Joshua's men hadn't even pulled out a sword yet. God was fighting for them. And while he was strengthening the Hebrews, he was depositing fear in the hearts of the enemies. And while the Hebrews were remembering God, God was preparing the ground for the battle. As the Hebrews devoted themselves, God protected the Hebrews. This is a big point, church. And that is, don't face Satan by facing Satan. Face Satan by facing God. Don't face Satan by obsessing yourself with the devil. You don't need to study the occult. You don't need to memorize all the names of the devil. You don't need to try to disentangle all the different levels of principalities and powers. You don't give him the time of day. Don't. All he deserves is a passing glance. Glance at the devil, but gaze at Christ. Set your eyes on Christ. God prepared the Hebrew people to face the enemy by calling them to turn their face toward him through gratitude and through renewed identity. So that's what you do, and that's what we do. Don't obsess yourself with the devil, but obsess yourself with Christ. Here's all you need to know about the devil. He is a fallen angel whose time is short, and he knows that. He is a fallen angel whose time is short. He's already been defeated. God stripped the spiritual powers, the spiritual rulers and powers of their authority. With the cross, he won the victory and showed the world that they were powerless. <laughs> Satan has no answer to the work of Christ on the cross. So you stay focused on Christ. And whenever you sense the power of the devil or evil or darkness, then you just turn your mind toward God and you begin to list what God has done. Remember what God has done. And then also you focus on who you are. Remember whose you are. And then, and only then, will you be ready to face Jericho. Amen? Amen. Thank you, Lord, that you have not left us with no resource with which to fight the force of evil. Thank you that you've reminded us even today whose we are and what you have done. Grant, O oh Lord, that you would bring these teachings to our mind over the next few days, that we could be stronger and we could stand strong and move in to the promised land that you have offered. Through Christ we pray, and all the church said,